He rules the world with a staff and a rod. We're a team, me and God. Hello and good day to you, brothers and sisters. It's uh, Saturday morning. I'm feeling pretty good. I can't wait to get back in Father's Word. This lesson, we're going to talk about the last wine press. The last wine press that is trampled by Jesus himself on the day of his coming, the last day of the age, which is also the day that he gathers up his army, his bride. In this video, um, we're going to clear up some things in Revelation that has been troubling the church for many, many, many years. Not only the timing of the rapture and his return, but much more than that. You know, what's meant in Revelation 14? Is Revelation 14 the rapture? Is Revelation 19 the rapture? Is Revelation 11 the rapture? Are they the same event, different events? When is the Great Tribulation? Okay, maybe we might even take a look at the Church of Philadelphia. What test do they get out of? Are there more than one test? Are there more than one armies? So I'm going to try not to make this too long. I'll try to focus mainly on the wine press. The last wine press. There's more than one wine pressed in the Bible in regards to the 70th week of Daniel. This one I'm going to try to focus on the last wine press. We're going to start at the end and work our way backwards to a large degree. Let's look at Revelation chapter 19 verse 15. Again, anytime you're studying with me, uh, you need to have your own Bibles open. You need to have a Bible it, your Bible, I like New King James Version, it, you know, you need to, if you're new to studying God's Word, try out a few. I like the New King James Version because of the way it capitalizes. It makes it easy for me to know when uh, God is actually mentioned. You know, maybe it's a capital H versus a small H, just as an example. Um, but you need to use a version of the Bible that you enjoy. You don't need to be spending a lot of time going back to the original Greek, going back to the original Hebrew, because it's not wrong to do that, but if you spend a lot of time doing that, then you are basically saying God is not ensuring in the last days that his people will have access to the truth. We have access to the truth. Um, you need to be the primary method for getting the truth when you're confused is by learning all throughout the Old and New Testaments where you can find that subject. In other words, spend more time digging in maybe books of the Bible that you haven't spent a lot of time in. You know, you'll find your answers there more easy than you will going back to the original Greek or Hebrew. I mean, Father makes this um, simple. So all you need is His Word and the Holy Spirit. Now, does that mean you can't learn a lot in seminary? Absolutely not. Alright? Don't want to pick on the seminary again. I've never been there, so what right do I have to talk bad about it? But I know they teach the pre-trib rapture there, so that right there tells me a lot. You can have no better teacher than the Holy Spirit. Now, does that mean that every time you think the Holy Spirit just gave you a truth, that he gave you that truth? No. He allows you, even if you're one of the people of understanding. And he's prepping you, getting you ready for when, you're, when he's going to turn you loose. You know, maybe it's not until the 70th week starts before he turns you loose, or maybe it's two or three years before it starts. But you're, not everything you think that just came from the Holy Spirit is true. And I know that for a fact, because he corrects me all the time. He goes, you know, three months ago when you thought you had it nailed down, that particular subject, guess what? You didn't. Here was the missing piece of the puzzle. Uh-huh. So don't think that he doesn't love you. Don't think that he's not helping you just because you may get, uh, you may realize three months in a row 
bam, bam, bam. i just been corrected by the Holy Spirit. Wow, do I need to start completely over? Do I not have a clue what I'm talking about? It's a process. He's hanging out with you. He's enjoying your company. You should be enjoying his company. You're going to make mistakes, but that's all right. Now, does that mean you should not tell anybody your understanding because you're afraid you're going to be a false prophet? Absolutely not. Tell people, say, look, I don't have everything nailed down. It may sound like I do sometimes, but when I believe something is the truth, it's my job to go out and tell it and show it in Scripture. Right. He, but a good way to start it would be to say instead of here's the truth would be here is my understanding as of this day I'm going to study the word every day I'm going to be corrected by the Holy Spirit often this is my understanding as of now but having said that you don't want to constantly be sounding like you don't have a clue what you're talking about you know because the Holy Spirit may have given you 90 to 95 percent of the truth and you just always go around starting your, your lessons saying, I'm sorry if I'm wrong. I'm sorry if I'm mistaken. I uh, hope I don't lead you down the wrong path. You know, be bold. But show in Scripture and always ask for forgiveness. And ask Him to protect you from becoming a false prophet. But do not give people, fellow brothers and sisters, a hard time because you think they're mistaken. We are a team. We're going to be on that storm cloud when Jesus returns. As his army, soldiers, shoulder to shoulder, defending Israel, defending Jerusalem. Long before you get your, your rest during the kingdom of peace, those 12 hours of that night of the battle of the great day of God Almighty, you and the, and the angels are his army. Now, Let's look at Revelation 19.15. This is what this lesson is about. This is something called the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Verse 15 reads, Now out of His mouth, capital H, goes a sharp sword, that with it He should strike the nations, and He Himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Revelation 19 is one of many chapters talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, it happens during the seventh trumpet period. The seventh trumpet is not just one blast and it's done. Or one hour and it's done. You know. Seventh trumpet blows. Bump, ba -da. Second later, everything's finished. It is done. No. No. When is it done? Now, the mystery of God may be completed before the it is done, but when is it done? At the sounding of the seventh trumpet or at another time? during the 70th week. Well, since I brought it up, let's turn to Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. This is not a trumpet. This is the uh, last plague of the seventh trumpet period. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done! That's when it's done. Seventh bowl, pouring, not seventh trumpet. Again, the seventh trumpet is the third woe. Did you know that? There's three woes, fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet, seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet is the third woe. Let's turn to Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, that's the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. The 
second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. I should have read verse 14. Second woe is the sixth trumpet. First woe was the fifth trumpet. Did you know that? Look at Revelation 9, verse 12. At the end of the fifth trumpet, five-month-long period of the stinging locust-like insects, it says that the one woe is past. That's the first woe, the fifth trumpet. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these. The sixth angel sounds. There's the second woe. The 200 million man army going forth to try to take over the world. Malaysia, Pakistan, India, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Central Africa, Northern Africa, maybe even up into Europe. Okay. Muslims throughout the world will believe that their Mahdi has come. And then at the sixth seal, they not only believe that their Mahdi has come, now he claims to be the God of gods himself. They will believe it. The Bible actually says that the world will believe it, except for the elect. I don't know if that just means mankind that's in certain parts of the earth or whether it means the whole earth what did I mean by that statement well let me see if I can find it something I want to show you in regards to who believes that he is the God of gods and who just finds it interesting to watch oh where did I find that Lord let's see uh, see if I can find it give me one second here it is right here. Revelation 13 makes a, uh, oh, right, a distinction. There's the word. That's a big word for a country boy. A distinction between the world following and being amazed and making sure they turn on Wolf Blitzer at 5 o'clock versus the earth, the Middle East, who worships him. I could be wrong here, but that's what it looks like to me. Read Revelation 13 yourself. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. Talking about the Antichrist beast kingdom, which is uh, seven cities. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and turned on Wolf Blitzer at 5 o'clock. <laughs> there it is. But over here, in the same chapter at verse... 17 it says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority was given him over every tribe tongue and nation all who dwell on the earth will worship him notice it says earth in verse 8 it says world in verse 3 the land of Israel is the land the earth is anywhere from where the Nile River begins up to Turkey, where the Euphrates begins, all the way back down to the Persian Gulf. All of that is the earth. The world, the four corners of heaven, is the world. The four corners of the earth is the Middle East and Northern Africa and Central Africa. But the world is Siberia, Alaska, Chile, Hawaii. This is the world. What does the world do? They turn on Wolf Blitzer at 5 o'clock. What does the Middle East uh, and maybe even Muslim nations in Indonesia and Malaysia and Kazakhstan and Afghanistan and Northern and Central Africa? That's the earth. What do they do? They worship him. Now, if you have Muslims who go into action in Europe, right at the time he goes into the temple and says, I am God, and he's bringing down fire from heaven, attack, attack anyone who is, does not worship me. And he's doing it with a Muslim flair, and they think he is the Muslim God of gods who's come, the Mahdi. Guess what they're going to do to you, Paris, France, and Frankfurt, Germany, and, uh, oh, what other geography places can I name? <laughs> Milan, Italy. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to kill everybody that they can. It's 
going to be chaos. All of these nice immigrants that came from Northern Africa. And yeah, they mean nice now. But when he goes into the temple and thoroughly convinces them that he is God, and he says to kill you because it's time to set up his kingdom, guess what's going to happen? They're going to all of a sudden pull out every butcher knife in their kitchen. Your next door neighbor. Am I trying to tell you to go out and hurt them now or to place fear in you? Well, you know what? No, but you see it on TV. It's already begun. Has the 70th week begun yet? No, but the stage is being set. But I wanted to point that out to you in Revelation 13. Now, we began this talking about when Jesus returns, the coming of our Lord, he is going to trample the winepress with the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. What is this winepress? Where is it at? We know that Jesus is the one who tramples the final last winepress. But when does he come? And where is it at? And who is he trampling? And what method does he use for their destruction? So we were at Revelation 19. Let's turn to Zechariah 14 and I will show you the method that Jesus uses to destroy these bad tasting grapes. When it's time to divide good tasting grapes from the bad tasting grapes, the good tasting grapes get in Revelation 14 and the bad tasting grapes get thrown into a pile for destruction. So they will not be uh, harvested together with the good tasting grapes. Where is that? Oh, right now we're looking at the method of destruction. Turn to Zechariah 14. Zechariah is the next to last book of the Old Testament. Don't forget Malachi that's after it. A lot of great stuff there. All right, Zechariah 14. If you watch some of my videos, you're probably very familiar with Zechariah 13 and 14. A lot of great information here about the last days. Now, if you turn, we're not going to read Zechariah 13 and 14 now. If you're not familiar with it, you need to. You need to read it. You know, because Zechariah 13 tells you the stats on who in Israel, how many people in Israel are going to be alive at the end of all this when Jesus finally comes back at the last minute at the last trump because they finally bow a knee to Jesus as their Messiah when all hope is lost and a lot of them are dead read it there's your stats Zechariah 13 talks about the stats in uh, all of Israel Zechariah 14 starts off with telling you about what's going on inside Jerusalem itself and the one taken, one left, 50% of the city of Jerusalem has had their young, strong men and their good-looking daughters thrown over the shoulders of the enemy as they go back to their pickup trucks and take them back as slaves. You need to read that. But here in Zechariah 14, Jesus comes and shows up on the scene because they finally finally bowed a knee to Jesus. When? At the seventh last plague, also known as the seventh bowl, when all the nations have been gathered to the uh, Valley of Armageddon, the wedding hall. Here we see Jesus coming here in uh, Zechariah 14 verse uh, 5, 6, and 7. All the saints with you. Don't let that confuse you right here. And all the saints with you. We know that he brings back those souls who sleep in Christ. They're glorified after he breaks through the atmosphere, or as he's breaking through the atmosphere, they're placed in their glorified bodies, and they're up on the storm cloud with Jesus. There's 20 verses in the Bible that I found already that say that Jesus returns riding on his chariot that is on a storm cloud and on top of the storm cloud is the sea of glass where he gathers his bride his army and places them into glorified bodies on the sea of glass when does it happen at the seventh last plague or seventh bowl 
during the third woe period when all hope is lost, when all the invited guests, good and bad, are uh, have arrived at the wedding. We'll look more at that. But don't let the all the saints come back with you confuse you. Because this could lead you astray to start thinking he's talking about a pre-trib rapture. Wow, they've all been taken up and now they're coming back. No. No. When he breaks through the atmosphere, all right, he brings back those who sleep in Christ. Those who are alive and remain are gathered up there with him. Now when he leaves the first heaven above that storm cloud, remember there's three heavens, first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. When he's coming down from that storm cloud, he's bringing his glorified army with him. Now, Zechariah 14 also tells you the time of day that Jesus returns. Did you know that? I love to point that out anytime we're in Zechariah 14. Well, I thought we're not supposed to know the day and the hour. Well, what does it say right here in Zechariah 14? It says, It shall be one day which is known to the Lord. Okay, yes, only the Lord knows. We're talking about Father himself. Sometimes the Lord means Jesus, sometimes it means Father, but either way it's the same Spirit. This is Father knows only that, day, uh, th that this day. But he says, you know what, even though I'm telling you that only Father knows the day, I'm going to go ahead and give you the hour, I'm just not going to give you the day. It's right there in the same verse. But, I'll tell you this, but... At evening time it shall happen. We need a confirmation on that. We need a confirmation that the Lord just told us, I, only I know the day and the hour, but you know what? I am going to go ahead, but I'm going to go ahead and give you the hour, but you still don't have a clue what year or, day or, or month or day looking at this verse, but at evening time it shall happen. neither day nor night but at evening right before night falls it shall happen what's the confirmation turn to Isaiah uh, Isaiah 7 verse 14 need some background music is it 714? Or is it 1714? Let's try that. Woohoo! There it is. Isaiah 1714 is our confirmation for what we saw in Zechariah 147. Isaiah 1714. Then behold, there's the butt. At eventide trouble, and before the morning he small h is no more, the Antichrist. Well, how do we know that's talking about the last days? Well, read all of Isaiah 17. Okay, talks about how the Muslim jihadists, once they become a beast kingdom, now they turn on Israel, they trick them, they come like a rushing of a flood, but they're actually a rushing of nations. They come on Israel, and we know that they're there during the day of the Lord. But then what happens? Finally, at the seventh bowl, during the third woe period of the seventh trumpet, God will rebuke them, and they will flee far away and be chased by Jesus, like the chaff of the mountains before the wind. Before the wind. What does that mean before the wind? That's that tornado storm cloud that we and Jesus, our bridegroom, is riding on. Yes, there are 20 verses that say that when he comes back, he's coming back riding on a whirlwind tornado. Worst earthquake like hailstorm of all times. And he comes with a plague. Well, isn't the seventh trumpet 
excuse me, isn't the seventh last plague the plague? Yes, but there is a curse or plague that he is blowing on the wine press. That's how he tramples it. But I wanted you to see that at 1714, it's the confirmation that he comes at twilight, just before it's fully dark. And yes, right here in Isaiah 18, the very next chapter, he gives you the month of his return. Yes, in the Zechariah 14, you saw it. He said, I'm not going to give you the day and the hour. But then he goes, but I'll give you the hour. He confirms it here. And then Isaiah 18, he goes, you know what? I'm going to also go ahead and give you the month. But I'm not going to give you the year. And it blows Christians' mind. They goes, it can't be, can't be. They say, I, I've been preaching Feast of Tabernacles now for 50 years. Jesus can't be coming back in the summer. Well, that's exactly what it says. In Isaiah 18, he hid it within that passage. Did you know that? He hid it there. I'm coming back at the time of the grape harvest in the summer but he says I'm gonna come before the grapes are fully ripe I'm gonna come before they're fully ripe and I'm gonna cut off the abominable branches all who belong to Lucifer did you know that the day of the Lord starts with the revealing of Lucifer and the day of the Lord ends with the revealing of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to the world did you know that? Starts with the revealing and ends with the revealing. For the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed. When? When he who restraineth is taken out of the way. Whether it's Michael or whether it's the Holy Spirit, either way, the pre-trip rapture is wrong. Whichever of those two you believe, but God says it's I. He takes responsibility overall. He says, I am the one who removed the protection of Judah. I will no longer pass by Israel. When? At the time of the day of the Lord. How long does the day of the Lord last? 42 months. When does it start? Sixth seal. After the great tribulation of the saints... Then the Antichrist goes back into the temple a second time and says, I'm no longer just the Mahdi. Look what I did all to the, all to the, to the Christians and all who would not uh, bow a knee to me. Look what I did. Their God didn't save them or stop me. I am God. And then the day of the Lord really begins. Okay. But, that's Jesus at the seventh plague, the seventh bowl, the last day of the age, his coming, when he comes, he cuts down the abominable branches. Read Isaiah 18, tells you the month. Well, is it July or August? Well, first of all, the Jewish months aren't July and August, and they don't start with July 1st or August 1st. You know, I have forgotten what month that is, but, so, you know, from early July to early August, whatever month that is on the Jewish calendar, that's when he comes back. But it's before the grapes are fully ripe. Even tells you, confirms it by talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And how uh, Ezekiel 39 says that the dead, people trampled in the wine press. Uh, and all the other people who die the birds of the air and the beasts of the field will eat on them for seven months it confirms it with the marriage supper of the lamb Christians are you doing the eating well the only way the Christians are doing the eating at the marriage supper is when the Bible talks about how your glorified body you're gonna get wings like eagles to defend Jerusalem if he turns us into birds we're eating if that's not meaning that we're turned into birds which I don't believe it is because we got to see what Jesus looked like after he rose from the dead 
So if we're not doing the eating, we're doing the meal preparation. Between us and our bridegroom, the commander of the Lord's army, it's a military wedding. If you didn't know that, if you think military weddings are so beautiful, well, you're going to have a military wedding. Bet you haven't been taught that in church. Uh, now, let's look at the curse. What's this? During the seventh last plague, do I say again, during the seventh last plague, within the seventh last plague is the curse or plague that Jesus is using to trample the final wine press. Let's go back to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14 is not the seventh plague in its entirety. Zechariah 14 is a plague during the night. The seventh plague is going to be issued all night long. That tornado and storm cloud driving and rebuking the enemy out of the land and destroying them. But as this storm cloud is heading south, from on top of the storm cloud, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, with the sword of his mouth, is going to be blowing a stream of fire and brimstone on the main forward operating base camps. That's what it's meant by, in the presence of the angels and the Lord, you will be burned up. Riding on top of that tornado... He's going to be breathing this plague. This plague is what Jesus himself uses to trample the wine press with great fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And here we go, Zechariah 14, 12. And in this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that great day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. So also shall be the plague on all of their animals." and their military camps. So shall this plague be. This is how Jesus is going to trample the final wine press while riding on the seventh bowl storm cloud as it's heading south. He will visit all of the nations that have come against Jerusalem and have just about completely wiped Israel off the face of the map. Now, will there be nuclear weapons used? The Bible says yes. Is this a nuclear bomb? No. This is Jesus doing the same thing that his angels were doing back at the time of Lot. Jesus' angels? I thought it was Father the Lord. It's the same spirit. The one... The ruler of Israel, capital O, the big O, the one. Go back and read those. What was it? Genesis 18, I believe. Did you know that Jesus visited Abraham and ate with them? Well, wasn't it God? What did, what did God speak to you through Jesus? He says, I am he. What do you think that meant? Yes, you need to go back and read Genesis 18. Jesus and two angels came to visit Abraham and Sarah. His faith was the example of the children of the promise. This is it, Abraham's faith. So I laughed and chuckled. She's 90 years old. You're going to tell me this time next year I'm having a baby? Abraham didn't laugh. That faith that Abraham had is the faith you have to have in Jesus to be able to spend eternity with him and Father. 
You have to have that, that faith. Faith of a child, it's sometimes called. Your mommy and your daddy tell you something, you believe it. Mary had that kind of faith. You've never known a man, but you're going to have a baby. This is the children of the promise, souls that were born of the free woman, the vessels of honor, the vessels of mercy. They're not the same as the vessels of dishonor that come from the uh, bondwoman. The only souls who are predestined to be drawn to Jesus from the foundations of the world are the ones whose souls came from the free woman. And when they know God says something, they don't doubt. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. You will be done. So, nuclear weapons, yes. Is this plague that Jesus uses to trample the wine press while he's riding on that seventh plague storm cloud? Is it a nuclear bomb? No. But the bee cities are nuked. How do we know? Read Zechariah 5. Read Zechariah 5. Read the chapter in the Bible that talks about how he'll take control of Iran's nukes. He'll set up his throne in Elam on the day he comes back and the ten horn turn. Zechariah 5, you need to read this. This is talking about the flying scroll. It gives you the width of the uh, width and length, excuse me, the length and width, <coughs> excuse me, of the warhead. Read about it. Goes over the face of the earth like a cruise missile, expelling out the house of the Antichrist and the house of the false prophet. And how the, uh, what's the word? Radiation will be in these buildings for many, many years. It will be completely uninhabited by life forms, even throughout the millennium. Read about it. But these aren't nukes. This uh, final wine press is going to be trampled by Jesus while he's riding on the storm cloud. So the armies of heaven, the angels and the bride, if you're a volunteer, read Psalm 18 and Psalm 110. You'll have your bow of bronze if you're a volunteer, and you'll be with wings like eagles, like birds, it says, hovering and flying around Jerusalem, Jerusalem defending it. Did you know that? But while Jesus is doing, uh, while you're doing that, Jesus, he's going to be breathing fire and brimstone out of his mouth as a sword on the camps. Right there in verse 15 of Zechariah 14. Those large forward operating bases of the enemy on the mountains of Israel and throughout the valley of Armageddon. So that's a plague during the plague. Now, back to Revelation. I hope this is good stuff. I hope it's a blessing to you. It was, it was and is for me. The truth always feels good. How you can watch TV instead of reading this, I have no idea. Maybe once you get the basics of what's going on and you realize that it's truth and it's very near future, maybe you'll start getting into your word. I pray that if nothing else, I get you to want to get into God's word and prove me wrong. This should be your number one form of entertainment. It will be if the truth is in you and you realize that in the next few years all of this is about to happen. You're making all these plans for retirement. You're worried about is Social Security going to be there? Folks, the Bible says in just the next few years you will not buy or sell unless you take the mark of the Antichrist. What does that mean? You're on your own. But, hallelujah, we have verses like what you find in Revelation chapter 3 that says, there are some Christians who will flee to the appropriate places and the Lord will take care of them for three and a half years. The Church of the Philadelphia. Now, does, is that only talking about Israel? 
I don't know. Will Christians out in Montana be afforded the same opportunity? I don't know. Don't count on it. Don't count on it. Be ready to give your life for Jesus. Why do I say that? Why do I think so many Christians are going to die during the fifth seal persecution of the saints? Well, turn to Revelation chapter 6. All right, right there in verses 9, 10, and 11, it talks about the fifth seal, great tribulation, persecution of the, of the saints, of the Christians. It says that there is a minimum number that God is waiting on. What? Has anyone ever told you that? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Both the number was completed. Both the number was completed. What number? Well, turn to Revelation 12:11. A minimum number of Christians must be killed in the Great Tribulation? What? Revelation 12, 11. This is how you overcome the devil. Well, we weren't going to be here. You are here and you must overcome the devil. Well, does that mean I'm going to die? Yeah, a lot of you are. Not everybody. But a lot of you are. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, whew, that's not me dying. That's Jesus is dying. I accept that. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place. Whoa, 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 we're not done yet. And by the word of their testimony, okay, that still doesn't say I got to die to overcome the devil. We're good. We're still good. It's Jesus and, and, and testifying that the Holy Bible is correct. All right. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. There's another and. Oh, oh. And they did not love their lives to the death. Is that the minimum number of the fifth seal great tribulation? Yes! That's it! You will be put up on trial. You will be put on TV. You, God will ensure it, will be given the opportunity to give a testimony before they slice your throat and chop your head off. How do you think the message gets out to the end of the earth so Jesus can return? Well, brother, you're preaching a pretty sad message. No! No, I'm not. I'm telling you how it ends with you being placed in a glorified body and chasing the enemy out of the land and setting up the kingdom. Look through all the Old Testament. What did Israel have to do to inherit the land? God didn't say, hey, you just keep walking. It's going to take you several weeks, but when you get there, I'll already have all the bad people dead. I'll have them uh, buried or whatever. They're going to be out of your way, and you just move right on in there. No, you can't set up the kingdom until you kill those who are in the land, in the way. That doesn't sound like Jesus. Jesus came the first time as the Lamb. Jesus is coming back the second time as the commander of the Lord's army. Get into your word. Blood, 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 death destruction father uses two different armies what he uses the army of his rod of indignation first to come against who Israel but all the surrounding nations will drink of the cup of madness too because these years where the caliphate is working on becoming a beast kingdom is going to Looking at the beginning of sorrows, first four seals, one out of every four people in the Muslim world is going to die. 
Why? Because they can't make up their mind which false messiah they want to follow. Oh, here comes another one. He's our leader. Whoa, here comes another one. Nope, we're going to follow him. One out of every four Muslims are going to die. Then, Father's going to use that army from the north, the rod of his indignation. Yes, Father calls it his army. He has two armies. The first army is used to reveal Lucifer. Comes against Israel after Israel, along with all the wicked counselors, have decided to uh, rid Israel of all the Christians in the Holy Bibles. I don't know what percentage Israel is going to be at of Christians once all this kicks off right now I think Christians only make up about two percent who knows maybe five or ten percent by the time this all kicks off but Christians are going to be put on trial give a testimony speak in tongues on worldwide television if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you and you better help them understand Lord when he's done using his rod of indignation army, Lucifer's army, you don't like the way that sounds, do you? And I don't either, but it's the truth. God uses Lucifer's army and calls it his own. Yes, he does! And then, at the seventh bowl, the seventh last plague, when Israel bows a knee to Jesus of Nazareth, and cries out to him as their Messiah they realize that they have been wrong because they've been led by the scribes Pharisees and hypocrites the entire book excuse me the entire chapter of Matthew 23 is all about who God's wrath is against he uses his first army Lucifer's army the rod of indignation to come against the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites who smacked Jesus, who spit in the face of Jesus, who pulled his hair, pulled out his beard, sucker punched Jesus in the gut, kicked him in the groin, anything you could think of, and, and made him unrecognizable. Those same people who grit their teeth looking in the face of Jesus are leading Israel at the time of the fifth seal. At that time, the good Jewish people are silenced and the evil ones come into power to try to make peace with the Antichrist and they work together to round up all the Christians and Holy Bibles and kill them and rid themselves of the Christians. Then the wrath, the true wrath that you read about in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 is unleashed at the seventh plague, the seventh bowl, when Jesus comes in person to pay back those scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites and all the people of the nations that come against Jerusalem he just considers them all cut of the same cloth. In other words, they kill his children. Who kills his children? Muslims kill his children. Who kills his children? Two-thirds of the Jews kill his children. Now, is Jesus' children Jew and Gentile? Yes. Who are the good Jews? The ones who don't take the mark. Who are the bad Jews? The ones who take the mark. That will signify, they will be manifested, those vessels of dishonor, those uh, souls born of the bondwoman will be manifested and they will take the mark. And they will persecute the Christians. And then the Muslims will turn on them. It's God's will. He's like, all right. Yeah, you were friends with the Muslims for a short time. Now I'm going to use the Muslims, who are now a beast kingdom, to come against you, O Israel, and O house of Judah. You two-thirds. Why do I say two-thirds? Well, look at Zechariah 13. One-third, Father will bring through the trial. Zechariah 13. Turn there. 
real quick. We know that in Zechariah 14, we're talking about the one taken, one left inside the city of Jerusalem. Now let's go back to Israel, and it says, And it shall come to pass, verse 8, In all the land of Israel, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it, and then I will bring the one-third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name. Believe me, anybody who took the mark of the beast will not be brought through the fire and allowed to call upon the name of Jesus. I don't think so, because the marked ones are the ones that have been manifested. That's those souls that were manifested in believing the lies of Satan. They are of the, their fathers, the synagogue of Satan. But the one-third will not take the mark, and he will bring them through the fire. Now, will some of those one-third who don't take the mark be killed? Maybe. Maybe bringing them through the fire doesn't mean alive. Maybe it just means that you will not take the mark. Amen. Now, where do we want to go back to? Let's go back to Revelation 14. It's just getting good. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's clear up some of this confusion. Does Jesus come back at Revelation 11? Does Jesus come back at Revelation 14? Who are these multitudes of people in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14? Who are they? When does Jesus come back? How does Revelation 19, how does Revelation 16 fit into all this timeline? Man, it's so confusing. We're going back and forth and back and forth. Let's clear it up right now with the help of the Holy Spirit. Guide us, Lord. All right. I said I was going to go backwards, starting from Revelation 19. Revelation 19 is the return of Jesus at evening time. When? It's, well, let's do this. Let's start this clearing up with realizing how many days the seventh trumpet, third woe is. Again, it's not one blast of a trumpet, and then it's over. The seventh trumpet lasts for many days, and we are told how many days the seventh trumpet period lasts for. Did you know that? He gives us the length of the time that these seven last plagues will be poured out. And he tells us what the reason is for the duration of the seventh trumpet. All right. How, when does the seventh trumpet blow? Well, if you turn to Revelation 11, verse 15, we read that. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world soon become no have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ and he shall ever and ever when does the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ Lord being father when at the sounding of the seventh trumpet blast but you just said brother that we have to wait till the duration of the seventh trumpet period is over. No. Have I totally confused you? Put your thinking caps on. Daniel 7 clears all of this up. There is a time to award the kingdom, and there is a time to possess the kingdom. Things have to be accomplished and finished and done with before you can possess the land. When, when did the land of Israel, the promised land, become the promised land? I say again, when did the promised land become the promised land? Did it become the promised land when the children of Israel defeated the last 
of the enemy within the land and finally got to sit down and go, whoo, now we've claimed it. It's ours now. We've killed the last enemy who was in the land in the way. Now they're all dead. Now it's our promised land. No! The promised land became the promised land when Father promised it. It was a done deal when it came out of his mouth. I pray that makes sense. When Father makes a decision, a judgment, a verdict, when he says, that's it. I've made up my mind. The promised land is yours. But, guess what? It took Israel a long time after Father uttered that judgment and decision before it became time to possess it and plant your flag. That's what's happening here at the seventh trumpet. Father, Daniel 7 clears it all up. Father has made a decision. He's made a judgment. He has reached a verdict. Why do I say verdict? Because Daniel 7 says it's a courtroom. A courtroom. And there are people giving testimonies and witnesses. Are we going to give the kingdom to the saints? Do they deserve it? To the elect, to the chosen, to the faithful? Are we sure they deserve it? They can't. We cannot reach a verdict in favor of the saints until they overcome Satan. What do they have to do to overcome Satan? It's on this page, Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by three things. The blood of the Lamb. The word of their personal testimony that they believe. That Jesus rose from the dead and he, his blood washed away their sins. And a third thing, they did not love their lives to death. Does that mean you have to be killed by the enemy? No, but if you are tested, I say again, if you are tested and the knife is at the back of your throat and you are told, deny Jesus or else. If you do not deny Jesus, no matter what they do to you, you have overcome the devil. A minimum number must go through the test. How many? One third of the nation of Israel. We just read it in Zechariah 13. One third is the minimum number. Hallelujah. Amen. At Revelation 11, the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The court in Daniel 7 has reached a judgment. Father himself who brought Jesus before the court. Turn to Daniel 7. Now. Keep the Spirit with us, Father. Please. Please don't leave us. Not now. Let us finish this message. A courtroom is watching the entire day of the Lord 42 months. Watching to see if the minimum number will overcome the devil. Watching. Daniel is, is seeing the future. He's watching the day of the Lord. He's watching the people in the court. Look at all the thrones that are set up in verse 9 of Daniel 7. Father is there, the Ancient of Days. The court was seated. Books were open. This is not the great white throne judgment. This is the day of the Lord court. Why? Because we've got to see if the minimum number overcomes Satan. When is Satan revealed at the great white throne judgment? No, he's revealed at the day of the Lord. Sitting in the temple proclaiming to be God. They watch. Daniel kept watching. Until, verse 22, the Ancient of Days' father came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints. That's the seventh trumpet blast. Du -du -du. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, then what? And the time finally came for the saints to possess the land, to possess their inheritance, to possess the kingdom of God. When does that happen? When Jesus comes. 
When does Jesus come? At the seventh last plague, when all of the nations are gathered to the wedding hall. What? Revelation 16. Quick, brothers. Turn there fast. Where is this wedding hall where we're married? There it is. Verse 14. No. Verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out its bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that, so that, the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of demons to do what? Performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth, and what? And the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. The invited guests, bad and good, have not all yet arrived. Therefore, we cannot reveal Jesus of Nazareth. But the seventh angel has already sounded. Yes. The court in heaven reached a judgment. Yes. But it's not time to possess the land. Why? Because the invited guests are not in place, therefore the wedding, the big revealing, cannot take place. But, thank God, it happens right after that. And they gathered them together to the wedding hall, to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon, the valley of Jezreel. Then the seventh angel poured out his bow into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done! It is done! This is not the mystery of God is completed. This is time to possess the land it is done. Hallelujah. Read all about the storm cloud that Jesus rides on. All right. The seventh last plague matches Revelation 19. Revelation 19 just gives you more information about what's going on during that storm. Don't forget Zechariah. Chapter 14 shows you the plague that Jesus administers while riding on that storm cloud. Hallelujah. Now, Revelation 14. No, Matthew 22 first. Quickly, brothers and sisters. Matthew 22. Have you not read this about nations during the sixth bowl that need, still need to be gathered to the wedding hall. I'm not going to read it now. Start here. Matthew 22. Read all for yourselves. Come to the wedding. It's an arranged marriage by father, the certain king, for his son. It's an arranged marriage. But guess what? The original natural branches did not come. Father was furious and decided they would be destroyed by the first army of God. The rod of his indignation would eventually come someday in the latter days and destroy those murderers and burned up their cities. But then guess what happens? Father says, go out into the highways and byways and invite anyone that you can find to the wedding. And they gathered together all whom they found both bad, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests, the Valley of Armageddon. Why? Because he's going to sit in judgment on that storm cloud while the storm is chucking off concrete cinder blocks of hail, while we are flying around with winds like eagles defending the land, defending Jerusalem with our bow of bronze. While all of that is going on, Jesus will sit and judge the nations that came against Israel. Some of them may be there to support Israel. Maybe they're America. Maybe they're Britain. I don't know. But they will be judged. And he will take a deep breath and blow that plague, that curse of fire and brimstone, on the camps of the enemies. This is a wedding hall filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, uh, friend, how do you come in here without a wedding garment? It's not advisable. And he was speechless. Then the king father said to the servants the angels bind him hand and foot take him away and cast him into outer darkness there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called but few are chosen this many are called and few are chosen are talking about the invited guests in the wedding hall 
you better have on that wedding garment to be snatched up, taken up to that seventh bowl plague cloud, that storm cloud, where the wedding is going to occur directly above the valley of Armageddon at the Lord's coming. No, you're not going to be raptured seven years earlier, but if you're one of the Church of Philadelphia, Revelation 3, and you flee in time, you will find safety in the wilderness if he directs you. If he directs you to places like the Fords of Arnon, the mountains of Carmel, the mountains of Bashan, he may. Elijah and Moses and the 144,000, maybe they'll tell you where you need to go. If you will listen to them before they are killed, you needed to know about the invited guests. That's the sixth bowl. That's what the demons, the three spirits have gone out to gather the remaining nations to the wedding for the big revealing of Jesus. Now, Revelation 14. What is Revelation 14? Is that the rapture? A mid-trib, pre-wrath rapture? Is that just simply uh, the seventh plague? Storm cloud? Is that all that is? The harvest? What is Revelation 14? Revelation 14 is when Jesus returns on the storm cloud of the seventh last plague and sits in judgment above all the invited guests in the wedding hall. That is the harvest. That is when we get our glorified bodies, regardless of whether we're in the wedding hall, the rest of Israel, or the rest of planet Earth, wherever we are. We will be snatched up. If you're in uh, South Carolina, guess what? You're going to the Valley of Armageddon, directly above it, on the storm cloud. That's where you'll meet the Lord, get your glorified body, and you will become a soldier for that night. It's a military wedding. The harvest is when we're separating the good tasting grapes from the bad tasting grapes. Now, read all about Revelation 14. Okay. This multitude that's seen on the sea of glass that you read about in Revelation 15, this is the glorified bodies on the storm cloud singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. The kingdom came. It became the kingdom. It was uh, the time to award the kingdom, I should say. The time to award the kingdom was the seventh trumpet blast. This is the last trumpet sound. When the Son of Man comes sitting on that cloud, the last trumpet is blown. This matches Revelation 19. You're just giving additional information in Revela Revelation 19. This matches the end of Revelation 16. It's all the same event when Jesus comes. All the same event. Now, you may say, well, then why did God put Revelation 16 there after Jesus comes? Because he wanted to give you more information. But remember, from see Revelation 11, Revelation 14, Revelation 16, this is all the seventh trumpet period that lasts how many days? How many days does it last? Turn to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, how many days does the seventh trumpet period last? Forty-five days. Why does it last? Why is the time to possess the kingdom 45 days after the awarding, the judgment of the kingdom? It's because we had to send out, Father had to send out, using the Antichrist, using the false prophet, using Satan himself, because God, remember, calls it his army. He uses them to send out those three unclean spirits to finish gathering the remaining nations of the world for the big revealing of Jesus. And it takes right here 45 days. Verse 11 says, From the abomination of desolation, which is the start of the great tribulation of the fifth seal, when Father says, from henceforth, we need a minimum number. 
One third of Israel, listen up. We need a minimum number from you. All right, a minimum number to do what? Overcome the devil. So from the start of the great tribulation of the fifth seal unto G, uh, excuse me, unto the time to award the kingdom, the seventh trumpet blast is one thousand two hundred and ninety days. But blessed is he who waits. How many more days? Till day 1,335. That's 45 days later. Then Daniel rests because then you will get to arise to your inheritance, which is the end of the days, the seventh last plague, the last day of the age. 45 days additional you must wait before you can possess the land. Why? Because it, we can't reveal Jesus until all of, this, of the nations who are invited arrive. Now, which nation's father invites to that wedding hall is up to him. Do the people of Siberia come? Do the people of Colombia come? I don't know. It's his doing. He directs those three unclean spirits that go out from the mouths of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself to invite nations to the wedding hall. Some will be for Israel. Most will be against. And he will judge them as he takes that deep breath from the top of that storm cloud and blows fire and brimstone in the presence of the angels on them. I wanted you to see the length of the seventh trumpet period. Now that you know the length, you need to realize at the end of Revelation 11, all right, and is, is, is the same event, the coming of the Lord. Look at Revelation 11. Did you know what the sign is in heaven before Jesus comes? Did you know it's the Ark of the Covenant will be seen above the Wedding Hall Valley of Armageddon minutes before Jesus breaks through the atmosphere on the storm cloud? Did you know that? Look at Revelation 11:19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the Ark of His Covenant was seen. Was seen by non-humans? No. It's seen by humans with eyeballs in his temple and there were lightnings noises thunderings earthquake and great hail guess what that matches the seventh last plague just before jesus breaks through the atmosphere with that storm cloud and his glorified saints and his and his angels what scene is the ark of the covenant most people thought it's got to be a cross it's got to be something that just signifies jesus it's the Ark of the Covenant that Father has never forgotten. It's everlasting. Turn to Matthew 24. Quickly, brothers. Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. <gasps> They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. No secret rapture. No secret rapture. He comes once in power and great glory on the storm clouds of the seventh last plague. Taking a deep breath, judging the nations who are there at the wedding hall. If you have on your garment, you will be immediately taken up to the storm cloud wedding hall. Given your glorified body, given your instructions... Soldiers, move out. Defend Israel and Jerusalem for the battle of the great day of God Almighty has come. You will not see in Mark 13 or Luke 21 the sign of the Son of Man. But you do hear in Matthew 24, and there it is in Revelation 11:19. It is not a cross. It is the Ark of His Covenant was seen with human eyes. So... Revelation 11, the sounding of the seventh trumpet, verse 15. This is the announcement of the verdict, the judgment of the courtroom in heaven at Daniel 7. The minimum number, one-third of Israel, Zechariah 13, has overcome the devil, Revelation 12, 11. And now it's time to award the kingdom to the saints. It's a promise. It's a promise. It's yours, but... Daniel kept watching until the time to possess the land of the inheritance has come. And he cannot, Father cannot allow you to possess the land until the wedding, which 
is the revealing, and that cannot happen until all the invited guests are gathered. That's the purpose of the sixth bowl. Hallelujah! So the end of Revelation 11, you have a 45-day period between time to award and time to possess the land. Revelation 14, the harvest, the judgment between the good-tasting grapes and the foul-tasting grapes, is also the same time coming of the Lord. Don't let Revelation 16's seven last plagues specific information coming after the multitude in heaven at Revelation 14 confuse you. That's not a rapture that happened way before the seventh last plague. That is the coming of our Lord. Now, after that, he gives you detailed information. But that is the seventh last plague which happens during the seventh trumpet blast of Revelation 11. It's 45 days. The harvest comes on day 45. When? Nighttime or daytime? Well, let me ask you this. If you were planning this movie, right? The movie that's made after the book is made. You've got the book. Now you're making the movie. If you're going to make the movie about the big revealing of Jesus Christ and power and glory and lightning and thunder, would you not do it in the period of darkness? Wouldn't it be more dramatic? Wouldn't it be more awesome? Yes, that's what Father does. He does it at twilight, evening time. It's nice and dark, but it's not nighttime. It will be. That storm will last for 12 hours until morning, then he is no more. Hello? But at first, at twilight, you start hearing the crackling of thunder. Guess what? Look up. You see the sign of the Ark of the Covenant? Your redemption is nigh! Hallelujah! Start singing the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb. You are on the cloud. You are on that sea of glass in Revelation 14. It is the seventh last plague. You've just given more details. Don't let that confuse you. Revelation 19, Revelation 14, the end of Revelation 11. It's all about the seventh last plague, the return of Jesus Christ on the last day of the age. Hallelujah! Woo! Brothers and sisters, thank you, Father, for being with us during this lesson. I pray it's been a blessing to all of you. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, please type them in. God bless you. We'll see you next time.